Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you may be in the world. Thanks for uh, joining today our webinar. Uh, I'm your host, Eric Neyberg, and I'm joined by Ravi Verma, who will be presenting the, the session today. Uh, before we get started, I'm just going to take you through a few things and a, and a few items, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get going. So just a little bit about Scrum.org. Hopefully you know a lot of this already since you're, you're here and you're visiting. But uh, Scrum.org, our mission is about improving the profession of software delivery. And, and we do that through training, through, through validation of that training and understanding and knowledge, and through our community of, of professional Scrum trainers like Ravi and, and many others. There's about 210 of them, I think, now. Uh, but also a lot of content and materials that are available on our website, um, whether they're guides or white papers or case studies, uh, forums and blog posts and the like as well. Uh, we put out these webinars at least once a month. Um, we've been getting up to now where we're doing some quite often two times a month to help, again, educate you and help you improve how you work and your knowledge and understanding of Scrum. Um, so if you go to the next, Ravi, and, and so how can you plug in? Obviously, um, if you go to scrum.org slash scrum pulse, uh, you'll find the webinars. They're also up on YouTube. There's also a lot of videos and other things available, both in our YouTube channel as well as uh, out in our resource center. So some guidelines for today. Your microphones are and will be muted. Uh, but please ask questions in discussion. You can uh, either go into the question box since you're already in to go to webinar format and, and click it and ask questions. Uh, you can also tweet uh, at scrum.org, hashtag scrum pulse, and, and we can take them that way. Ravi will take questions at the end, um, and, and hopefully we'll have time to answer them all, but we'll certainly do our best. And with that, I will hand it over to Ravi. Thanks, Eric. Um, so hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Ravi Verma. I'm a Scrum.org professional Scrum trainer and evidence-based management consultant. Uh, I've had the honor of being uh, you know, selected, interviewed, and trained by Ken Schwaber. Um, uh, I'm the founder and org whisperer at Smooth Apps, uh, an agile consulting firm based out of Dallas, Texas. I've got about 20 years experience in software delivery. Uh, I've been an agile coach for companies, uh, for 10-person companies, and also for 10,000-person companies. So I've learned a lot. I've made a lot of mistakes, got a lot of uh, scars, uh, and hopefully try not to repeat the mistakes over and over, same mistakes uh, over and over again. Uh, really, some things I'm really proud of having accomplished uh, as part of Scrum.org community. Uh, we created the software code of ethics with other Scrum.org trainers. Uh, we created the Scrum Pulse series. This webinar series, I created this with Mark Norman and Scrum.org maybe two and a half years ago. We've got probably almost 40 webinars. Uh, and we are partnering with Eric and Scrum.org and the Scrum.org community to create short videos on YouTube called Scrum Tapas. Probably got almost 60 videos. So these are some things we are really proud of. At a personal level, uh, after a particularly painful engagement, I created the Sabot Agile Manifesto and Sabot Agile Principles. So that was cathartic. If you have a sense of humor, take a look. If you don't, please stay away. Um, and I also have my own personal video uh, series on YouTube called Agilato. Uh, some of the things that make me weird, this is a partial list, not complete. Uh, I binge watch crime da dramas on Netflix, Amazon Prime, and I watch them on mute with closed captioning. I'm also a vegetarian who hates most vegetables. So this is a little bit about myself. Uh, the ideas in this presentation are inspired by some amazing people in the Scrum.org community. So the foundation for this presentation is uh, evidence-based management, which I learned from Ken Schwaber uh, and uh, from Patricia Kong, both at Scrum.org. Uh, I learned a lot about value-driven de uh, delivery from the Scrum.org Professional Scrum Product Owner course, which is guided by our two stewards here, Don McGrill, who is, uh, I, I call him the sensei of Scrum, and Ralph Jokum, the maestro of Scrum, amazing and inspiring leaders, uh, Gunther Berian and Mark Norman as well. So these are the people who inspired me uh, in terms of the ideas in this presentation, and the common thread that unifies all of us is Scrum.org. Any flaws uh, are all mine. So. Question is, why are we here? Who is the target audience? Uh, one of the things that I you know, learned from Ken and also from Dave West, who is the CEO of Scrum.org, is uh, we try to build bridges uh, with people who have 
shared thinking. Uh, we want to try and find commonality and uh, try to build bridges with people who have shared values and who have a shared goal, right? Um, so try to amplify our commonality and all the differences. So is this a presentation for people who love Scrum or Agile? Is it a presentation for people who hate Scrum or Agile? No, the answer is none of them. Uh, I don't care whether you like Agile or hate Agile. What I'm interested in is, do you love delivering sustainable and measurable business value? And do you hate the needless destruction of human potential? And if you do fall in either of those categories, you're in the right place. Okay, So that's why uh, I wanted to have this conversation. And the question is, what's the problem we are trying to solve in this uh, webinar? Or what's the problem we are trying to explore in this webinar? Because if we misframe or misdiagnose or misstate the problem, we could have an awesome solution to the perfect solution to the wrong problem. Uh, which is not going to help us, right? So mediocre solution to the right problem is way better than a perfect solution to the wrong problem. So what's the problem we are trying to explore here? We want governance. It's completely uh, okay and it's healthy for us as we spend time and money on behalf of our stakeholders to be uh, committed to making sure that we are governing how that time and money is spent and are we truly adding value to our stakeholders. So this conversation today is about rigorous governance. It's about regular governance. It's also about framework independent governance. Taking care of our customers, our investors, stakeholders, and employees should not be something that varies based on what software delivery framework you use. That should be a framework agnostic goal that unifies us. And it's also about value-based governance. Uh, governance in my mind should not be based on activities, but it should be based on the outcomes. Are we taking care of our stakeholders, our customers, uh, our investors, right? One of the quotes from Ken Schwaber that really inspires me is, and I'm paraphrasing here, you know, do the right thing and the results will follow. And if the results don't follow, at least you did the right thing, right? So he's always challenging us from an ethical perspective to do the right thing in terms of outcomes and not about activities or blindly following rituals that do not generate the right outcomes. Okay, so this conversation is about value-based governance. Why do we care? We care because we want sustainable competitive advantage. You know, large companies which were standards of the economy are disappearing at an alarming rate. Toys R Us just went under. Um, I saw some painful messages on Facebook because a lot of people grew up and they had fond memories of Toys R Us. Right? So sustainable competitive advantage is the need of the day. Just because you've been around for a decade or 100 years doesn't mean you are going to be around for the next decade or 100 years. Right? You cannot afford to be complacent. Right? So we want governance in service of doing the right thing and also in service of surviving and thriving in our economy. So the question is, Unsustained competitive advantage, sustained competitive advantage. What is the difference? When I say sustained competitive advantage, I am talking about firms that have been in a leadership role in their industry for a long period of time. So that's how I define sustained competitive advantage. Uh, so something I learned in the, in the strategy class in uh, SMU Cox School of Business from my strategy professor, Gordon Walker. I want to pause here for a moment. And I want to get your thoughts. So there's a comment box in your GoToWebinar panel. I would love to get some feedback from you as you think about companies that have sustained competitive advantage, those that have been in a leadership position in their industry for a long period of time. What is the first company that comes to your mind? Type in the name. And when you think of unsustained advantage, companies that were once at the top of the, the heap in their industry, and they, they just couldn't hang on to it. Either they are gone or they don't exist anymore, or maybe they exist, but they are no longer part, part of the leader pack, right? What name comes to your mind? So I'm probably going to give you just maybe, I don't know, 15 seconds time box, type in those names. And Eric, if you don't mind, as the names start coming in, could you just read them out, please? Yeah, we're, we're getting a couple of interesting ones, uh, so, some, some common ones. Uh... So some that I don't think people would think of as well. So uh, uh, oh, actually, it's it's hard to tell if these are the unsustained or sustained. Uh, if you could tell yeah, me, 
uh, some, some are saying some aren't. So some listed are IBM, Nokia, um, mm -hmm. GE sustained. Uh, oh, so leader leader could also be Apple as a leader or sustained Toyota, mm -hmm. uh, IBM mm -hmm. again, Apple again, Ford and BlackBerry as uh, unsustained. To uh, mm -hmm. Howard, Howard Johnson restaurants, I'm, I'm guessing that's an unsustained since they don't exist anymore. Uh, sustained AT and T, unsustained Yahoo, IBM again, um, Nokia unsustained, um, unsustained Snapchat. Amazon is sustained. Yeah. Um, obviously, Blockbuster, I'm sure, one that is quite often used. Uh, Ericsson is unsustained as well. Um, so good. a couple of really good. good ones coming in. Thank you, guys. Good. Thank you so much for uh, being engaged. Uh, it's always hard when you're doing a webinar. You can't see people. You don't know whether they are uh, clipping their toenails or uh, playing Candy Crush Saga. So it's good that at least some are not. Uh, so... You know, one of my life coach used to tell me the quality of life is determined by the quality of questions we ask. So the next question is, what makes these two categories of companies different? So if you had to write a tweet, and the old tweet, 144 characters or less, and identify the single most important differentiator between these two categories of companies, what comes to your mind? Again, I'll just give you a short time box, and Eric, I'd love for you to read out the answers as they come in. Single biggest differentiator between these two categories. Hey, Ravi, and they're, again, they're they're all starting to come in slowly but surely. Uh, let's see here. We've got a couple interesting ones. Approach to market, listening to customers. Uh, here's one similar. Teamwork and collaboration. Uh, company culture. Creative and innovative, or creative, creative and innovation, uh, technology, mm -hmm. reducing risk, customer service, viable products, ability to control the marketplace, ability to change, ability to be agile, willingness to change. So that's interesting. Uh, all right, so we've got one which is ability to change, and then are you actually willing to do willing it? Willing to change. Yes. Super Very important. Cool. And then, then awesome. uh, a couple others similar. Very good. Okay. Thank you, everyone, again, for staying engaged. Uh, as I look back at some of these companies, one common differentiator could be complacence versus clarity of thought. I've been uh, you know, involved in some of these companies, I promise you. I had nothing to do with it. I got there after <laughs> the damage was done. And in other companies, I've had friends uh, who used to work there. And you know, without taking names, uh, some of the, one of the companies that you guys mentioned earlier uh, I had a friend who said that they had an idea that the competitor, uh, you know, uh, which was the same as the competitor that ultimately destroyed them, but internally, the powerful decision makers uh, rejected that idea. And I've heard that Kodak itself may have had the, you know, digital camera uh, sitting on a shelf and they decided not to, you know, push it, right? So sometimes we get complacent and one of the worst. Uh, sometimes success is the worst thing that can happen to you, if, especially if it breeds complacence. And, you know, Eric was talking about the feedback that you guys gave. There's a distinction between the ability to change and the willingness to change. So if sometimes I've been in companies and I, as an entrepreneur myself, have been guilty of getting too attached to a particular idea or a product about my firm. And, you know, I that becomes my pet baby. And I keep trying to push that product or service on the market when the market is clearly giving me feedback. No, Ravi, this is not what we value, right? So my emotional attachment to a particular product or an idea uh, gets in the way of me having clarity and looking at the sign from the market to say, hey, wait a minute, I know I might love this, but this is not uh, aligned with my goals. It's getting in the way, right? So as I take a step back and I try to contrast these two groups of companies, one differentiating kind of characteristic that comes to my mind is those that may not sur have survived, they may have complacence, while those uh, who do adapt, who are nimble, they are willing to detach themselves emotionally from a product or an idea 
that may they may dearly that may be dear to them but if it's not serving the greater goal they have the clarity and they pivot and they adapt right one other distinct, distinguishing characteristic is something that uh, you know many of us come dot all trainers and consultants we hear as we go and try to help clients uh, i call it the blockberry space space mart syndrome it's like a combination of blockbuster blackberry myspace you know kmart and it sounds like this yes but in the real world right so um, you do similar exercise as i just did in this webinar uh, in the pro scrum dot all professional scrum product owner course and you know when people are asked to contrast the sustainable uh, companies versus unsustainable companies they have tremendous clarity and objectivity when looking at a third party company or they have the wisdom of hindsight okay everybody knows blockbuster made mistakes blackberry made mistakes and then we start introducing ideas around let's say scrum and people say yes ravi all that sounds good in the theoretical world but in the real world it's never going to work for us we are a very unique snowflake right so this is uh, for me when i start hearing those statements yes but in the real world sometimes these are early warning uh, indicators that okay maybe we are at risk of becoming another blockbuster or my space right so because i see that there is a lot of clarity when we are trying to judge and perhaps condemn a company that went out of business and suddenly that clarity did uh, deserts us when we are trying to look in the mirror right so that in my mind that's one differentiator between companies that survive and lead and those that don't so what are the most important questions we should be asking or if imagine we had a time machine we went back to blockbuster we were uh, part of blockbuster or blackberry uh, hindsight is 2020 but knowing what we know now what are some questions we could have asked uh, if we had been part of those companies right or perhaps today we could right now be part of a company that may become the blockbuster of tomorrow right so what kind of questions might we explore to alter the course of the future so three questions uh, inspired by scrum dot org evidence based management question number 1 was it valuable right imagine we go back into time uh, in blockbuster are the products and services that we are delivering what were they were they valuable were they timely i'm not talking about the iron triangle you know pmi iron triangle on time on scope on budget i'm talking about timely not too early not too late at the right time right uh, was the product or service that we delivered was it timely and was it sustainable so it's not a flash in the pan it's not boom or bust right so based on evidence based management if i create a circle of sustainable competitive advantage here's what the circle looks like you know you conceive value you deliver value and you sustain value very simple another question how do we know right all of the companies that we mentioned in the unsustained competitive advantage they had smart hard working people who went to work each day trying to do the best for their stakeholders they were not stupid they were not morons they were not lazy so i am chances are they probably asked they were asking the same questions uh, but how do we know whether it is timely whether uh, it is uh, valuable whether it is sustainable and this is where uh, i feel the scrum dot org evidence based management approach uh, provides some guidance instead of going by your gut or my gut can we use hard objective data and evidence from the market to reach these conclusions or have these conversations data driven conversations about was it valuable was it timely and was it sustainable so i'm going to uh, build a an equation which will be a mnemonic for you to remember the essence of this webinar along the course of the webinar so this is mvp1 we probably have three or four versions of this equation as we as i integrate the ideas i'm introducing so mvp1 of this equation is if you want sustainable competitive advantage in your company you need to start using evidence to determine are you conceiving value are you delivering value are you sustaining value right so it's not your gut what your gut says or my gut says it's what does the evidence say in terms of was it valuable was it timely was it sustainable okay so this is mvp1 of our equation 
So the idea is let's start using evidence to shift away from complacency-based management, gut-based management, and HIPPO-based management to evidence-based management. Some of you might be wondering, what is HIPPO? And this is something I learned from Patricia Kong. HIPPO is the company's most highly paid person's opinion. And you may have found yourself in situations where there's a very powerful stakeholder in the company who is saying, my gut tells me this is the right way to go. There's nothing wrong with that. Intuition is very important. However, you have small controlled risk and small controlled experiments to test out your intuition or your hypothesis. And you can't just rely on intuition alone. You must complement intuition with data so that you don't keep pushing, you know, spending good money after bad money. When data is suggesting that the opinion or intuition of a powerful person uh, was not uh, was not accurate. Okay. So how do you apply this webinar or the ideas of this webinar to your project or product the moment you leave this webinar, right? One question you may explore in your teams is, uh, let's take a step back, look at our product, uh, look at our company, and try to identify some indicators for each of these three key value areas, which is conceive value, deliver value, sustain value. Let's identify the top three indicators, and I'm sure this will stimulate some very valuable conversation among your team members and your stakeholders, right? So what are the top three indicators for each KVA? When I do this workshop, here are some answers that come uh, often come up on the team, right? So when I when they put up the, the post-its, I hear indicators like team velocity, individual velocity, percentage increase in velocity, right? What percentage of our sprint commitment did we, uh, did we meet? Um, there is no such thing as sprint commitment in, uh, you know, in the Scrum Guide. There is a forecast. What's the defect leakage ratio? What percentage of on time, on budget, on scope delivery do we have? So these are some common indicators that I, I see from my clients. Um, one question I'd like you to explore before you jump into operationalizing or measuring these indicators is, could there be some unintended consequences of these indicators on our circle of competitive advantage? Uh, it's outside the scope of this webinar. We don't have enough time for me to drill into all of them, but maybe I'll touch upon a few. So if you are measuring team velocity, and I've been in companies where the CTO said, you thou shalt have a 25% quarterly increase in velocity for every, um, every team. Uh, well, if you are working with a smart bunch of developers, all they need to do is write some code to right shift their velocity by one Fibonacci series point, right? Uh, and you do it every quarter, and then there you have it, right? You have your improvement in velocity, but did it really deliver more business value to our clients? Probably not, right? Uh, if you measure individual velocity, uh, which is which is very interesting, but many of my, uh, I, I've heard many clients or some people use this. Uh, this defeats the whole purpose of commitment to team goals because now each person is trying to optimize for themselves uh, and not try to partner with our team members uh, to deliver a greater goal, right? So this may not be aligned with the greater goal of uh, innovation and value. So my word of caution is what gets measured gets managed. Again, this is something we speak about in uh, the you know, standard or PSPO course, choose wisely, right? Uh, make sure that you are guarding against unintended consequences and try to tie back the indicators you choose to that circle of sustained competitive advantage. Just to give you a sense of what kind of indicators we would recommend that you consider uh, from a scrum.org perspective, we have some illustrative KVAs and KPIs. These are not prescriptive. These are just illustrative KVAs and KPIs. If they make sense for you, use them. If not, replace them but we wanted to draw a contrast between the indicators that many practitioners in the industry naturally gravitate towards. And we just wanted to contrast against those indicators which may have unintended consequences. So uh, in the evidence-based management, one KVA is innovation. Uh, the second KVA is time to market. I call it deliver value. And the third KVA is current value, which I prefer to call sustained value. So in each of these, you have some illustrative KVAs uh, and KPIs, uh, and 
I'll maybe touch upon a couple of them. And if you're curious to learn more, then you can visit the scrum.org page and read the evidence-based management guide. So one instance, uh, uh, maybe one example of innovation. How do we know that uh, our products are innovative? Well, you can use, uh, look at the usage index, which is kind of like Google Analytics. How frequently are customers using a particular feature? What percentage of the features are used 50% or more? Um, Innovation rate, what percentage of your budget are you spending on delivering new, new functionality, new value, as opposed to patching and defect fixing value you delivered in the past? How many pro production defects do you have? If you're looking at time to market, how frequently are you releasing? What is the gap between releases? Uh, one of my Scrum.org PSTs, Summer Lawrence, said she calls it the days of no value. Right. How many days does it, calendar days does it take between subsequent or successive releases? Uh, how many calendar days does it take from concept to cash, from the time someone had a cool idea to the time it's deployed to production, right? And finally, current value, uh, revenue per employee, employee sat, customer sat, maybe partner satisfaction. Because in today's economy, people will give you a leading indicator that they're about to leave you through their satisfaction scores. And if you don't do immediate course correction, uh, it's gonna to be too late, right? So again, the key takeaway from this slide, these are not prescriptive K, uh, KPIs. These are just uh, illustrative KPIs uh, to contrast uh, the temptation to go back to maybe some more traditional metrics that can have unintended consequences, okay? So continuing with the refinement of our equation to remember the uh, you know, circle of sustained competitive advantage, we need to choose KPIs that resonate with our executives where, because that's where a lot of power lies. We want to elevate the transparency and empiricism to executives. So MVP two of our equation of sustained competitive advantages, if you wanna have sustainable competitive advantage, you must use KPIs that elevate empiricism to executives and our KPIs are indicators uh, of evidence that show you whether you are conceiving value, delivering value, and sustaining value. Okay, so that's MVP2. So now the question is, imagine you share this idea, you are sold, you share this idea to your colleagues, what can be the top three objections? I've been introducing these ideas in companies probably over the last, I would say, uh, three to four years, if not more. The three most common objections that I get when I introduce these ideas are, I call them the three C's of uh, evidence-based management. The first is correctness. Uh, the first knee-jerk reaction is, Ravi, these are not the correct metrics, okay? These are not the correct indicators. Knee-jerk reaction number two is, even if they are the correct metrics, it's hard to establish the causality because when you're looking at uh, organizational outcomes or product outcomes, it's a very complex system. It's a complex adaptive system which is impacted by multiple triggers or stimuli. So when you see a change in a particular indicator, how do you figure out, well, did this happen because we did automation testing or we had backlog refinement or did it happen because of macroeconomic factors, right? Which is a valid concern. So I'm trying to prepare you for some objections you may hear or you may be experiencing right now, right? Causality is objection number two or the second C. And the third C is complexity. So when people uh, move past the first two objections, the third objection usually is, this is operationally very complex, right? It's too complex for us to gather these metrics. It's like a project in itself. We don't have time or money, so let's abandon it, right? So some things that I learned from Ken Schwaber, you know, as he was introducing these ideas, in terms of how do you manage these threes, right? So for example, uh, if the objection is, well, these are not the correct indicators, one possible way is to say, awesome, let's start talking about what might be the correct indicator. What would you recommend instead, right? Let's try something. Let's try it for a month. Let's come back and see what we learn. If it was the challenge was causality, then what I would recommend is that's okay. Maybe something else moved the needle on, an, uh, on a particular indicator. So it may be hard to create a solid line between a trigger or an intervention or an adaptation at an activity level and an outcome level indicator. That's okay. It's like you're driving a car. Um, sometimes the, the tire pressure goes down. Sometimes the gas tank gets empty sooner than expected. Uh, 
you may not always be able to establish causality, but it's you can be a safer and more effective driver if you have that dashboard at your disposal, as opposed to covering the dashboard saying, I can't establish causality, so let me drive blind or let me fly the airplane blind, right? Data cannot be your enemy, right? Even if you can't establish causality, you can have data-driven conversations about causality. And the last is complexity. Uh, so the example I still remember that Ken Schreiber gave us when we were doing the workshop was um, net promoter score, you know, employee satisfaction, right? In today's economy, if your employee walks out of the door, it's, it takes a lot of time to hire a new employee and train that person until they are delivering value. Uh, many companies may bring in a management consulting firm to do an annual employee satisfaction survey. It's like an act of God. And most of the time you spend like, thousands or millions of dollars and we most of the time we don't do anything about it so the knee-jerk reaction is you know if you are asking me to measure net promoter score or employee side it takes forever and what ken schreiber said is well uh, yes ideally maybe you do a com exhaustive survey it will take forever it's expensive uh, how about you go to the cafeteria at the same time on the same day of the week every week or every couple of weeks you just hand people out a couple of so, you know, post-its as they are walking out of the cafeteria, maybe 10 post-its, ask them to rate their mood or satisfaction with the company on a scale of zero to five. Just be consistent and start creating a baseline and watch out for deviations from the baseline because those are telling you something has happened, right? So you can inspect and adapt. It is not as good as getting a management consulting firm in for an exhaustive employee survey, but it's probably just a little bit better than flying blind, right? So I've had clients where their knee-jerk reaction was, hey, this is too complex. And whether it's employee satisfaction or whether it is finding the number of dollars of revenue recognized, usually we have been able to narrow down the operational complexity so that it's not perfect, but it's better than flying blind, okay? So this is how you can manage the three Cs uh, so that you, you're not flying blind and you don't become the blockbuster of tomorrow. So MVP3 of our equation, to remember the key messages from this uh, webinar, elevate empiricism to the executives, use evidence of conceiving value, delivering value and sustaining value, and start managing the three Cs or the three sets of objections for evidence-based management, okay? So now let's imagine you have operationalized this. I've got multiple clients who are who have implemented this approach and they are reviewing these scoreboards uh, at, the, at the C level. So let's imagine we have the KBAs, we have the KPIs. Um, how do we know which of these indicators are leading indicators or lagging? And why should we even care? Right? It's an important question. So let's pause and take a step back. Let's distinguish between lagging and leading indicators. So lagging indicators are outcome related, very easy to measure, but hard to influence. So, you know, if you are uh, in, in the US, if you are part of the March Madness and, you know, you look at the brackets and your brackets are busted by some Cinderella story. Um, when you're looking at the scoreboard or you're looking at the bracket, you know which team won or lost. You know if your bracket is intact or if it's not. But by the time you have the answer, the game is over. You cannot change the outcome, right? That's an example of a lagging indicator. What might be a leading indicator? Leading indicators are activity related. They are very hard to measure, but once you pinpoint them, they are easy to influence, right? So maybe if you're adjusting your bracket before the season starts, you can look at the performance of different teams, their relative strengths and weaknesses, and as they are progressing through the rounds, you can look at the statistics and adjust your bracket for the next round, you know, if your pool allows it. But uh, that's an example of a leading indicator. You're still in the game. The game is not over. You are trying to adjust, uh, you know, your activity based on what the indicators are telling you. Okay. So if you were to apply the ideas from this webinar in the context of your product or your company, uh, in a previous exercise, you may have identified the top three to five indicators for the three KVAs, conceive value, deliver value, sustain value, what I would invite you to do with your teams is to now lay them out and in a spectrum, starting with the leading indicator and going on towards the lagging indicator. Okay. Uh, the reason I want you to do that is I want you to now ask yourself, what is the point of maximum leverage and how can we influence it, right? So we have a bunch of indicators. We don't want to boil the ocean. 
We want to laser focus and be intentional on our intervention. So if we wanted to make our future just a little bit better and not overwhelm ourselves by trying to do on too much in too little time with too little resources, where would we focus? Where would we laser focus? Pick one and identify an activity that can allow you to move the needle on the point of maximum leverage, okay? And I also want you to think about what's the ultimate lag indicator for your product or your company. Ultimately, there will be one score on the scoreboard that will decide, did your company win the game or lose the game? Did your product win the game or lose the game? You need to have crystal, you need to be crystal clear about what is that score. And you need to share that with every member of your team. So you know, what are you optimizing for? One technique that I learned from uh, Mark Norman, another PSC, is uh, the Franklin Covey Four Disciplines of Execution. And one of the practices that they use is they express a company's or a product's ultimate lag indicator as a wig or a wildly important goal. And they suggest using a template like this. Increase or decrease your some indicator from a current value to a target value by a target date. So it could be increase the number of website visitors, uh, you know, engage visitors who spend more than five minutes at a website from 1 million to 2 million by December 2018, right? It's very crisp and unambiguous, right? My invitation to you is whatever is your context, whether it is a product or a company or a line of business, be very clear about your ultimate wildly important goal or ultimate lag indicator and socialize it and make decisions in the context of this wildly important goal. Okay, so now if you were to tie all of the ideas in this webinar together, what you can do is you can start creating a value-based scoreboard in your context. It could be a company, a line of business, it could be a product, uh, and this is a replica or a mock-up of the scoreboard that some of my clients have created. So they have an ultimate lag indicator at the top. Uh, and then they have leading indicators based on the key value areas, right? So in value, you may have a leading indicator, number of customer renewals, number of dollars of payment process, quality, you want to trend down in terms of production defects, customer escalations, cycle time, you may want to go down in terms of uh, calendar days between concept to cash or release, uh, you know, your how much time it takes to get a release out. And you may also want to monitor customer engagement, partner engagement, employee engagement, right? So now you have a holistic scoreboard. And if you have quantified targets, ideal targets, you can have an ideal burn up or burn down and you can plot the actuals. And whenever there is a deviation between actual and intended, that is a great opportunity for inspection and adaptation, okay? So now, imagine, imagine you had a time machine and you traveled to the future. And unfortunately, your current company has become the blockbuster of the future. It's the poster child of Blockberry Space Smart Syndrome. Scary thought, but it's possible. How do you feel? Hindsight is 2020 when we're looking in the rear view mirror and judging blockbuster. But what if you became the blockbuster of tomorrow? What can you do today to create a better tomorrow to change the future of your company? How can you apply the ideas we've discussed in this webinar to avoid becoming the blockbuster of tomorrow, right? After you leave this webinar, what might get in the way? Chances are what will get in the way is the complacence, right? You go. And pretty soon you'll hear the statement in your mind or the mind of a, or from the mouth of a colleague, yes, but in the real world. You know, we are unique. Architecture is too complex. Process is too complex. It's never going to work over here. I'm asking you to apply what we've discussed in this webinar to use evidence to shift your organization from complacence to clarity. Choose wisely. Okay? In closing, some ideas I want to share with you to wrap up this conversation have value-driven governance, regularly inspect value, don't get caught up in methodology or framework wars, use whatever framework you're using. If you happen to use Scrum, Scrum has been created with specifically with events and activities injected in the framework to enable data-driven governance and data-driven learning. So for instance, 
if you were to create a product scoreboard, review it in sprint review and look at all the money that you have spent on behalf of your investors over the past few sprints. What value is it providing? This is an important point for value-driven governance. That's the Scrum sprint review. Okay. Now you got to learn. Uh, what is this information teaching me? Maybe in a retrospective, you can extract the wisdom and you've got to change. It's not important to just learn if you don't apply the learning to change the future. So now you, you extract that wisdom and you apply the wisdom in backlog refinement, in sprint planning, choose a specific sprint goal which has an intention of moving the needle on one of these. So be informed by the data and then change the data for change the future and continuously inspect and adapt your daily plan in the daily scrum with the laser focus of optimizing for the sprint goal, which should be tied to your scorebook. Okay. So what we want you to do is we are inviting you to shift from gut based management and hippo based management and activity or efficiency-based management to outcome-based management, right? Value-based management. And in our line of work, humility is important. We need to be humble. We don't have all the answers. We need to be curious, and we need to use these indicators to learn what the market is telling us and adapt, right? So enable rigorous, regular, value-driven governance Value unifies us, frameworks polarize us. Let's not fight about frameworks. Let's just do the right thing for our stakeholders. Let's deliver value, sustainable value. Value resonates with executives. Value is what enables sustainable competitive advantage. Okay? So remember the equation for sustainable competitive advantage is kind of like a variation on Einstein D is equal to MC square. So ev elevate evidence to uh, the uh, uh, executive level, elevate empiricism to the executive level, use evidence for conceiving value, delivering value, sustaining value. Whenever you hear uh, organizational objections, master the three C's, which is complexity, uh, causality, and correctness. Okay. So in closing, incrementally develop your product scoreboard after this webinar. Add one indicator every 30 days or less. Don't try to boil the ocean. Try to have one conversation every 30 days or less. Uh, if you're using Scrum, exploit the Scrum events and activities. That's why they were created. Inject this, these indicators in your sprint review, extract the learning in review and retro, and adapt your future or change your direction so you alter the future in backlog refinement, release planning, and sprint planning. Uh, as I leave you, I want to leave you with a quote from Andy Groves, who was the, the, the late Andy Groves, who was the CEO of Intel. Uh, and this is the title of his book, Only the Paranoid Survive. So be paranoid, survive, and thrive. Just because you've been in business for a long time, don't assume that your past is a guarantee for your success and survival in the future. Okay? Uh, introduced a ton of ideas. Um, if it's overwhelming, don't worry. We've got plenty of resources at the scrum.org website. You can read the evidence-based management guide. There is an awesome webinar by Don Madrid, uh, who's a PST on Agile Metrics, who ties everything together. Uh, there's another webinar by Mark Norman, another PhD, and he talks about empiricism at the product owner level. Okay, So learn more. Uh, as we start wrapping up, I'd love to get feedback from you. What was the most valuable insight? How you can apply what you learned in this webinar to achieve sustained agility and avoid becoming blockbuster? Is there something you want to le learn more about? So uh, I'm going to hand it back over to Eric. Eric is going to see your questions. Uh, monitored through different channels, whether it's Twitter or through the chat panel. Uh, and uh, I'd love to do my best to answer as many questions as I can. So, Eric, back to you. Great. Thank you, Ravi. Awesome presentation, as always. And uh, please uh, uh, bring in your questions. Uh, Ravi, I'm sure, would love to, uh, to take them and answer them. So, we've got the first question we've got um, from Srinivas is uh, Apple has grown with gut feeling of Steve Jobs. Uh, how, how, how would that be different from evidence-based management? Although I think that's, there's a lot of myth there versus reality that is just gut-based. But go ahead, Rob. Yeah, you know, uh, one of the stories I remember uh, about Steve Jobs is, you know, when Apple was going, you know, it was in a dark place and, you know, Steve Jobs was no longer in Apple. And then he came back and one of the, 
things that he did was he killed off a bunch of Apple products, right? Um, so I do agree and appreciate that you know a lot of the inspiration for behind Apple was probably the intuition and the gut of Steve Jobs. However, I feel I will say yes and um, I feel that when data is showing that one of the things that they loved. Uh, is no longer serving them i feel that they you know they say no so when they do not allow intuition to get in the way of data and success so again i'm not saying that you shouldn't have gut based leadership but it cannot be exclusively gut based management you must complement your gut and intuition with data and if the data is telling you over and over again your gut was wrong be humble be curious and adapt right don't be attached to your gut stay attached and committed to the goals and the purpose of your company right so it's, it it may be a false dichotomy to say well it's either gut or it's evidence why don't we use both why don't we use gut and evidence which i think ties to the next question ravi which is what about vision of the company uh do the staff work from the vision that's formulated by the corporate executives or where do you see vision fit and how does that fit into EBM? For me, uh, you know, vision is, um, you know, the purpose of the company, right? Why do we exist, right? So in Scrum.org, our vision is we want to improve the profession of software development. And, you know, for my personal company, it's recapture the magic of making IT. So we have to have that mission as, or the vision as the North Star, the reason we get out of bed every morning, right? What is, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, Michael Angelo says, you know, I saw the angel in the rock. I just liberated the angel, right, by chipping the rock away, right? So each one of us has a personal vision. We'll have a company vision. And how I feel evidence-based management ties to the vision is my KVAs and my indicators must be uh, a means to the end, must tell me, am I or am I not getting close to that aspirational North Star, right? So if I have a vision which is pointing in one direction and indicators which are pointing in a different, there is a disconnect, right? So we want to make sure we can reconcile and connect the line between our indicators and vision. And uh, for each indicator, ask ourselves, okay, wait a minute. Is this truly helping us get closer to the vision? And if not, either we need to change our vision or we need to change the indicator, right? So that's a great question to ask. Please do make sure that there is no dissonance between the uh, indicators that you have chosen, the lag indicator, and your vision. Great question. So uh, the next one, I think, is more of a I think it's more of a statement than a question. But I'm gonna I'm gonna pose it just out there because if it is a question, please if you could restate the question and, and send it back in. It says we we can't say that whichever companies are doing great will survive in the next ten years or so. Or once they do that, they become a complacent um, and they'll lose out. Totally agree, a hundred percent. So, if there is a question in there, please you know, let us know what that what that question is. Um, yeah. So, uh, I think uh, we need a sense of like a sense of danger, right? No matter how strong you are, you have to have a sense of danger that somebody faster, better, cheaper is coming close by, right? Objects in rear view mirror might be closer than they appear, right? So, you need to have you can't be complacent. You have to be paranoid and hungry uh, and scrappy to keep getting better. Sorry, Eric. Please go ahead. Yeah, if you're if you're not paranoid, you're uh, someone's going to catch up from behind, uh, yep, and pass you by. So regarding innovation rate, how can that be measured? Uh, do you have suggestions? Uh, are, are there different ways? Is it something like story points? Is it money being spent on maintenance? What what are some of the measurements that you use for innovation rate? Yeah, so you know one simple metric suggested by the Scrum.org uh, EBM guide is you know a very crude. Uh, rate is what percentage of your time or money is spent on new feature development versus defect fixing. So what one of my clients does is that they have a review with their uh, chief revenue officer and chief technology officer and in their scoreboard, evidence-based management scoreboard, and they just um, use Jira story points per sprint for story points for new features versus story points for defects. Okay, so one of my clients, what they do is they've sucked in, uh, you know, one of our coaches has helped them suck in data from different systems of truth and, uh, you know, into Periscope. And that's that's a simple metric that they're using. And as we see a trend over time through retrospectives and course corrections, 
we are actually seeing a measurable decrease in the number of story points we are spending on defects and the number of defects we are getting in production, right? So that is a very simple indicator that my clients have used to do course correction and get visible feedback that they are delivering more innovative features to production. So that's a leading indicator. It's necessary, but not sufficient. That's for innovation rate. So, so, so Ravi, when, when you in the title talked a bit about governance and, and, and things, can you give some examples? A lot of your examples have been more, uh, I'll say, IT type organizations. Can you describe EBM and, and, and governance and how those tie together in organizations that are more, uh, I'll say, um, externally product focused? So things like uh, medical devices, uh, military weaponry, and, and, and those sorts of things, and how, how EBM can be used in those matters. Yeah, so you know, one example is, um, one of my clients is a federally, federally regulated financial organization, right? Uh, they don't have a profit motive. They are there to you know, serve the communities, and we are using, we, are, we have introduced EBM uh, in, in a financial organization. And so for a financial organization, one of the indicators could be uh, reducing regulatory kind of risk, right? They are increasing regulatory compliance, right? Even if it's a, I feel a lot of these metrics or indicators suggested by EBM are industry agnostic, technology agnostic. So, you know, if you're a medical device company, um, you know, how many, the, number of defects that you're getting, the number of customer complaints that you're getting, it is agnostic to what domain you are in. The only difference is that the penalty for failure is much higher in a medical company or if you're sending an astronaut to space or if it's, you know, uh, if it is some software but that is being used in combat, right? So I don't feel that the indicators here are um, tied to or specific to an industry or a type of company. I think they are agnostic. Uh, but if, whoever asked the question, I would be happy to have like a 30 or 60 minute conversation to use a concrete company that they, their company and try to help them apply these indicators to their unique situation. Thanks, Ravi. Um, a couple other questions coming in. Uh, let's see, how, how do you overcome, uh, or how do you do, how do you challenge Nicely, um, uh, you know, um, I'm actually I'm not sure I completely understand that one, so I'm I'm going to hold off on, on that question and ask a, a follow up to, to that person first. So, what are some recommendations of metrics that can be used to help show uh, cost and waste? Um, a context switching from the context of switching rapidly or switching too rapidly, uh, changing priorities from stakeholders and so on. Are there measurements that can help there? Yeah, one, um, one thing I like to do is I like to monetize the cost of unfinished work. So let's imagine you are working on you know a bunch of stories or the backlog items for one sprint, and you know um, you every company probably has an average blended hourly rate of a team member, contractor, or employee, whatever, right? So you know imagine you have ten, you know if you have a hundred dollar an hour hourly rate, you have 10 people on a, on a scrum team. Basically, you're burning $1,000 per hour, right? If you have a, every week, it's $40,000 per week, $80,000 per sprint. Imagine, uh, because of constant context switching or changing in direction across sprints, 60% of the code or the functionality that we developed is sitting as inventory that is not being used. We could actually have an indicator that is showing, okay, 60% of $80,000, it's actually $48,000, right? So we can actually show over time how much unused inventory is there uh, in terms of dollar amounts, right? So this is the cost of pivoting direction. Now, it's neither good nor bad, right? Ken Schwaber teaches us, try to move away from good, bad, have value neutral conversation. Is it effective or ineffective when it comes to our company vision and mission, right? So. Uh, monetizing the uh, waste in terms of whip work in progress that has not been deployed to production or that is not helping us make money, save money, reduce risk, save lives. Uh, monetizing it and then showing it, showing the cumulative 
on a line, usually that gives people sticker shock. Like, holy smoke, what just happened? Like, how can we allow this to happen? So that's a suggestion I have. So um, I've got some clarification. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, so how do you challenge that highly paid person? How, how do you challenge that executive, wh whoever it is, really, uh, without da damaging uh, relationships? And I think uh, evidence is a great way of doing that, but I'm sure you've got some opinions there. Yeah, I mean, I like to channelize conversations constructively. And, you know, some these are things that the, don't come naturally to me. Um, because those of you who have worked with me, I, you know, I can be a bull in a china shop, but I'm trying to get better. Uh, so, you know, I try to, I work with good people and they try to ask questions in a polite and non-threatening way. And, you know, some of the uh, colleagues that I've worked with in the past, they ask questions like, would you be okay if we measured this indicator for a month, right? So great. Uh, I love your hypothesis. Uh, would you be okay if we measured uh, how that hypothesis is doing in the market. Or, uh, you know, if you go to coactive coaching, whether it's through CTI or through Lisa Atkins' awesome course, uh, you know, Lisa Atkins, I learned a lot of good open-ended questions by uh, attending Lisa's uh, coach. And so some of the things that I learned from her in her training is, uh, you know, powerful open-ended questions. So, okay, your gut is saying that this is the right feature to de deliver. Awesome. How might we validate that this is actually working. What might be the indicators that can help us confirm that your gut is in the right direction, right? So I would say as opposed to having a polarizing conversation, you are wrong, I am right, your hypothesis is wrong, try to have open-ended questions. What might tell us we are in the right direction? How frequently might we validate? Uh, would you be okay for a once a month inspection or just a once a monthly review. So that those are some techniques that I have found to be useful because I'm not threatening someone, I'm not disrespecting. I'm just saying, hey, would it be okay for us once a month to just get together for 60 minutes and just see how things are going? Is that okay with you? Uh, and usually people, most people are uh, okay with that kind of an approach. Great, Ravi, thank you very much. So uh, I think we've got time. There's one, la one last question I think we have time for. Um, hopefully it's not too long of a one, but if we want to start with gut and then try to prove it, that out based on evidence, how long should that experiment be? The quest, the answer is how much time and money are you willing to throw away, right? It's situational, right? So what Ken Schwaber says basically is, or the creators of Scrum, they want to protect your company from throwing away more than one month's worth of time and money, right? So the, the creators of Scrum, they're saying, deliver value 30 days or less. So my answer to you is, uh, I don't know. How much money can you afford to throw away on a bad bet that your gut was saying was right? That should be your risk exposure. That should be your window. And basically, if you can afford to burn one month of company's money and one month's time to market, but your feedback loop for validating your gut is three months or six months or one year, there is a dissonance here that I'd invite you to reconcile. Great. Th thanks, Ravi. Um, yeah, and I, just to add, add to that, I think it's it's not about one, that experiment doesn't necessarily stop after one sprint either. You, you're going yeah. to inspect because you're going to learn from that sprint, from your stakeholders, from users, and you're going to continue to inspect and adapt and improve on that. And that gut, and I've seen this happen in, in real world projects and products that I've built, what you thought you were building, actually, as you now built it, deployed it, got feedback from users and or stakeholders, and, and you continue to inspect and adapt it, you end up building something that was very different from what you, that original gut was based on that feedback. So you're not throwing it away, you're not wasting. Often you're learning from that and, and you're continuing to evolve that original thought based on real evidence, based on real feedback. Um, yeah, most, so you the evidence, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead Eric. Uh, I was just going to say, but many products are not used as they were originally intended or designed. Yeah. And use evidence to make your gut better, faster, stronger, right? I mean, it's not a, it's a false dichotomy, right? So use, go by the gut, use the evidence that will teach, tell your gut what to, you know, what to forecast next, right? So anyway. So, so, so with that, you know, continue to connect with the community, connect with Ravi. Uh, his, his contact information is up on our website. Um, or it's even in the invite that that, uh, that was on the website. You can click there and connect with him. 
If you have questions, ask them in the Scrum Forum. Uh, lots of people are always responding, whether they're, they're folks from scrum.org or, or folks out there doing it and learning. Read the blogs. There's a lot of great content out there for, from our Scrum trainers on how to do this, how to deal with these difficult situations we've just been talking about and so on. So uh, with that, I, I just want to say thank you very much. I know that this is an hour out of your day where you could be doing something else, and, and hopefully you've gotten a lot of value out of this. And thank you, Robbie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Keep calm. Come on. Thanks, folks.